Now, let's start the program by introducing our first speaker. Professor Rachel Buchbinder is one of the most known researchers in the field, and she has been the leading person to introduce the Lancet series. She is currently a professor at the Department of Epidemiology and Preventive Medicine at Monash University. She is also a director of Monash Department of Clinical Epidemiology, Gabini Institutes, and she is active as a clinician. She is a rheumatologist, so she sees patients one day a week. Rachel, we are very happy to welcome you and are looking forward to your presentation. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here and, and um, to present uh, on behalf of the Lancet uh, authors. Uh, this is the pitch that we gave to the Lancet that low back pain is the number one cause of disability in the world. Uh, and global and national efforts to address the burden are disproportionately low compared to the size of the burden. There are many professional and public misconceptions about back pain, and many of these lead to harm. And as a consequence, there are huge evidence practice and evidence policy gaps. There is also the increasing problems of vested interests and perverse incentives. Uh, and we're all responsible for some of these problems. And at the end, I'll just touch on research ways that um, Birgitta raised as well, because I think we are uh, not uh, helping the problem either as researchers. There, I don't know how many people on the web are from low and middle income countries, but we have an impending tsunami of back pain disability in these countries. They're largely responsible for their increased disability because they have the largest increase in population and ageing population in the world. Their increasing prosperity means that the uh, middle classes are expanding and they have increased expectations for better care and as uh, infectious diseases go down, chronic disease go up. So there's a lot of business opportunities. And they're already making the same mistakes using the, what I call the failed model of care of high-income countries. So uh, as the Lancet uh, all, uh, editors uh, commented that we need to have a better understanding of back pain so that we can deliver and reimburse um, better care and reverse uh, these, these problems. Uh, as um, Birgitta said, we, we actually hired a media company and uh, we had almost 15 million unique um, Twitter impressions um, using this hashtag um, within the first week, uh, and many of them were within the first day. Um, so there, there is huge interest in this problem. Uh, NHS immediately put something up on their web, and they put more things up on their web related to our series. Uh, it was in Australia, uh, international, even the, even the US uh, had media. Uh, in the, there was also a lot of media in developing countries such as India, um, The Guardian and even the New England Journal chose to um, talk about the Lancet series in their journal. So this is the three papers. They're, they're um, fully free online. Anyone can read them in the world. Uh, and I'm going to mainly talk about the burden and then the complexity of care. So we know that um, uh, the one-year prevalence of uh, back pain is very common and it's involved, it, it affects people of all ages, all genders. Uh, it peaks in working uh, age, middle age, uh, and in most of the countries in the world, it's a higher prevalence in women. Uh, there are some countries where men have a higher prevalence, but this might be due to the culture and women not, not reporting back pain in those countries. This showed, these slides showed the different distributions from different regions of the world. So you can see that the patterns are very similar. Um, the prevalence is higher in high income countries, but low and middle income countries are catching up uh, as they adopt our types of medicine and actually make the problem worse. And there doesn't seem to be any difference between urban and rural areas. 
it's increased 50% since uh, 1990. So this slide in blue shows the increase in the uh, burden in, in terms of disability adjusted life years. And you can see that the burden has increased mainly in middle-aged and older people. This slide represents the years lived with disability uh, and the red is uh, in order of the, the most, um, uh, the highest ranked cause of disability in different countries. Uh, it's top ranked in both developed and developing countries and out of 195 countries, it's in the top 10 in all of them and it's in the top three uh, in 153 and it's the top one in, in about 100. Uh, I've highlighted here the Nordic countries uh, where back pain is the number one cause of disability across all of the countries. It also uh, is accompanied by massive costs, both healthcare, social care and uh, lost um, production, so lost worker productivity. In fact, work disability accounts for 80% of the total cost in high-income countries. And in Europe, it's the largest cause of medically certified sick leave and early retirement. Uh, and the social compensation systems are largely responsible for international differences. So, for example, uh, USA is much higher than Japan. Uh, but it, even within uh, Europe, uh, there is high rate high differing rates of um, work, workers' disability. This slide was a six-country comparison by Han Anima and others and shows that um, the Netherlands have the highest return to work rates uh, and Germany, uh, uh, Norway and Sweden have the, the lowest. So you can influence it. The reason I'm showing you this is that um, these are modifiable, that we can, we can change these um, for the better. We know that low back pain contributes to the cycle of poverty and widens social inequalities. We know that retirement um, from chronic low back pain is greater amongst people with socio low socioeconomic status and education. It's the leading cause of retiring early uh, in older people and it's greater than all of these other conditions that I've listed there. Uh, and we also know that retiring early from uh, work because of back pain um, means that you accumulate less wealth. And again, this widens social inequalities even further. Uh, so this study from Australia showed that if you uh, retire because of um, back pain, you acquire only $5,000 in wealth by the age of 65 uh, versus nearly 340000 if you remain in the workforce. So again, this is widening the social inequalities and, and leading to poverty. There is also the personal toll on people, loss of independence and social identity. There have been several studies now looking at qualitative studies and the effect on the person. So lives on hold, lowered self-worth, uh, stigma, premature ageing, physical deconditioning, uh, all of these things are uh, factors that we need to think about when we want to treat someone with, particularly with chronic disabling back pain. And a few years ago, we developed a model um, looking at all the types of burdens that people with back pain have and all the interactions. So it's really complicated. So no wonder the care is also needs to be complicated. And again, this is of even greater concern in low and middle income countries uh, because informal employment is very common. So it's much less possibility to organise job modification. So these people just don't work. Uh, and uh, there are lots of studies now um, in Africa in particular looking at um, disability related to back pain and, and uh, difficulties in fulfilling um, ob obligations, both traditional and social. So the second part of my talk is really um, working out, showing you, demonstrating that that we have um, we have been causing the problem. Uh, there are lots of harmful practices, uh, and this means that there's less uh, money and less resources and less healthcare available for people that really need it, and we need to stop doing it. Uh, and so this is part of paper two. Um, and I think that we're largely responsible for this problem. Um, people with um, back pain in traditional settings, 
um, don't, they're not disabled. They think it's a normal part of everyday life. But once they're exposed to medical care, that's when it becomes a medical problem. We know that um, it's very complex, the care and the problems. And so the person with low back pain will bring in um, at the bottom their, their personal systems of coping, their beliefs, um, their family's beliefs, their work, their friends' beliefs. Uh, on the right are the um, workers' compensation systems and insurance systems, and, and they also will input on, on disability from back pain. Uh, there's also the workplace itself and how you interact with your employ employees, employer, fellow workers. Uh, and then there's the healthcare system that we live in, and they're very varied. Uh, there are many different clinicians that uh, have an interest in treating back pain. A lot of them um, manage back pain according to their own interests and perhaps according um, to how much money they can earn. Uh, and on top of that, there's the social expectations. And we're living in a world where people expect more. They expect that they can get tests whenever they want. And they expect that we have the answers. And on top of that, there are issues uh, like medicine as a business, as I've already alluded to, uh, I think we have a huge problem with lack of science literacy among clinicians, let alone among the public. We have a lot of direct-to-doctor and direct-to-consumer advertising, and the media have to sell their, their products, so they sensationalise um, a lot of stories and, and give people misleading facts. Uh, and so uh, these are just quick Google searches. Uh, this is at the back shop, a one-stop shop for back pain. Uh, you can get uh, massage. You can get um, the mobilizer, which will cure your back pain. Uh, these are very quick fixes on the internet. Um, you can instantly cure yourself with these different remedies. Uh, this is a newspaper clipping, a breakthrough that's going to stop the opioid epidemic. Uh, this is stem cells um, that's, uh, that's going to just revolutionise back pain. Uh, this is another one-off 10-minute cure. And if you read the, 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 um, the fine print, this is image-guided pulse radio frequency treatment that uh, we know has been proven to be ineffective. Uh, this is what I see every day day when I look at Australian Doctor, which is one of the um, professional rags in Australia, they are popping up these ads, um, could it be neuropathic pain? And it looks like everybody in the world has neuropathic pain. Is it time to consider Lyrica? Uh, and they also directly uh, advertise to patients as well. So is it any wonder that there's an epidemic of useless and often harmful care? Uh, we know across the world that there's increasing presentations to emergency departments. Uh, education advice are rarely provided. Uh, and many clinicians and patients still believe that you should rest and not go to work. We know that we have still have a huge problem in imaging. And in fact, over my 20 years in back pain, um, the problem has got many, many times worse despite our best efforts. And I'll show you some data. Uh, and increasingly, um, we don't um, treat back pain in a non-pharmacologic way as first line. Uh, but it, it's, there's more. <laughs> it's like there's more uh, bad care. Um, there are many areas that still treat people with passive modalities. Uh, in high-income countries, we know there's a big problem in, of opioids, and I'll show you data from Sweden. Um, we, there's still very little use in low- and middle-income countries, but I think that's going to change. Um, injections and surgery, um, again, we know the problems in high-income countries, um, and we actually know very little about what's happening in low- and middle-income countries. We know it's hard to get people to exercise um, because the healthcare system um, constrains it. You don't get paid for for um, exercise, and we know psychosocial aspects are poorly managed across all settings. So here are some examples from high-income countries. Uh, in Australia, only 20% of GP consultations does a patient receive um, back pain advice. In, in New South Wales, we have an epidemic actually across Australia where people with acute back pain um, arrive uh, in emergency departments. Uh, and it, 20 to 30% come by ambulance. So it's a really acute, serious problem. 
Uh, and in New South Wales, there that the data there for how many people get imaged, how many people get opioids, how many people get admitted. And if you get admitted, you're in hospital for about 10 days. We know uh, that in other countries, there's also a big problem with ED management and with um, bad care in terms of imaging and um, not, not providing the right care. Uh, in my hospital, um, we looked at this uh, in terms of people arriving um, to our emergency department. We're a private, not-for-profit. Um, have a look at how many people get opioids. And we have over 50% of people who get admitted to hospital. Uh, so that's at my hospital where I'm still trying to make my hospital a choosing wisely champion, uh, but they're very resistant and they keep um, buying new MRI and CT scans, which drives me insane. It's also happening in low-income countries, uh, the same problems with emergency care, um, provision of pain medications instead of non-pharmacologic care, uh, and use of um, outdated modalities of treatment uh, and a lot of imaging. So what's behind the epidemic of poor care? Uh, well, as I said before, widespread misconceptions, a deeply embedded culture that's resistant to me demedicalising the problem, vested interest and funding arrangements that reinforce wrong care and discourage right care, and fragmented and out dated models uh, at, at various levels and hopefully we need to work together to try and address that. So this is a recent study uh, looking at 300 people presenting to, eat, uh, to primary care in Australia and over 50% of patients believe that it's necessary to get image and everyone should get it. So it's something that's in our culture. Uh, this is a study of um, GPs, and GPs, again, there's a high rate of believing that you need to, to rest, uh, to have imaging. And what's really alarming is GPs who have a special interest in back pain treat back pain significantly worse than GPs who don't have a special interest. Uh, and, of course, they're not happy when I talk about this, um, but, again, it's all related to vested interests. This is what's happening in Australia with imaging. Uh, so a huge increase in imaging over the decade. Uh, and you can see that while plain x-rays have gone down a little bit, CT scans have gone up through the roof. Uh, MRI is growing and that's about to get massively worse um, because now GPs are going to be able to um, uh, get an order an MRI that's funded by the government. So I expect that will go the way of knee MRIs in Australia that went like that, uh, with $50 million spent on knee MRIs in the first year that GPs were allowed to access to them. So I think the major issue are harmful miscon The most harmful misconception is that a specific cause um, can be identified and therefore you can fix it with appropriate treatment and cure the problem. Uh, and as a clinician, of course, I want to make sure that I, I don't miss the specific causes that are serious or treatable. But as a result of that, we have a problem of overdiagnosis, uh, unnecessary treatments, costly and harmful. And in reality, most back pain in primary care does not have an important or specific diagnosis that we can identify in 2018 and there are some serious um, causes but you can get the idea that they might be present mainly from history and exam and as you can see they're very uncommon in primary care uh, and this is a study of over a thousand patients who presented in uh, Australia and only one percent of people had an identifiable specific cause that that could be treated in, in a different way. So what about structural diagnoses? Uh, this was standard in the, in the last century that you could diagnose and fix the underlying spinal pathology. And with our new imaging modalities, we can identify more and more uh, what I call incidentalomas, and this is disc protrusion in a 24-year-old who has no problem. There's no doubt there is a link between symptoms and structure, and this is a study looking at people under the age of 50 
where people with symptoms have a higher prevalence of different abnormalities. But how do you work it out in an individual patient whether how to how to treat it and and whether it's actually those abnormalities that's causing the problem? And over the age of fifty, those structural abnormalities become normal. So many people have abnormalities um, if you look at MRI. And so by detecting the abnormalities, you might do more harm than good. And this is an old study now, but this was a randomised trial that randomised people to get an X-ray and MRI when they presented with back pain. And the disability at 12 months was exactly the same, um, but you were two and a half times more likely to receive surgery if you had that MRI. Uh, so there are lots of consequences of imaging uh, we know, as I said, low prevalence of serious conditions, weak correlation between imaging and, um, and, and symptoms, and it has a minimal impact. We know that MRIs can't predict who's going to do better to different sorts of treatment, and we also know that uh, imaging findings don't predict future problems. But on the other hand, we know that we give people tremendous doses of radiation so X-rays are 65 chest X-rays and CTs 165. Um, that's not the low CT radiation. But we also worry our patients. We worry the clinicians by the reports that they receive from the radiologists. And there's a lot of downstream harms. The other problem is that, that people don't treat it like a chronic problem. We know that if you've got back pain, you have a much higher chance of it coming back. And although the, in the acute episode, it gets better very quickly, irrespective of what you do. And by a year, very few, um, uh, the mean pain is very low. But half of the people will continue to have problems and a small percent will continue to have severe problems but most of that is due to psychosocial factors, not to this structural problem. Uh, and there's some really nice, consistent work now looking at trajectories over time. Uh, and on the left, you can see the main factors that, that predict um, severe disability. And again, if you look at the bottom, lower social class. So again, we're widening social inequalities and, and causing poverty. Uh, this recent study shows that if you have radicular pain, your prognosis is actually absolutely no different to if you don't have radicular pain. So um, people say, well, we have to do an MRI because they've got radicular pain. Well, perhaps that's not true. So this is what happens in, in clinical practice is that you just have varying levels of pain, um, but you tend to present the doctor or the or other person when it's more severe and then you're more likely to get um, more invasive and, and um, bad care. So for acute back pain, it doesn't really matter what you do. You could get elective surgery, outpatient um, medicine, or whatever's in the box that, that Carol is holding. It doesn't matter because the clinical cause is exactly the same. And these are data from trials and cohort studies showing that the recovery from acute back pain is just the same. And thanks to um, my colleague, Martin Underwood, this is the data from the British Spine Registry. You start off with more severe pain um, and you probably end up with worse outcomes if you have surgery. So we do have an ethical drive to try and give people adequate pain relief, but we haven't thought about the unintended consequences. This is data that I just found from the Karolinska Institute. We know opioid-related deaths are increasing in Nordic countries, uh, uh, similar to the US. Uh, we know in Australia that deaths from opioids have gone up 15-fold. Uh, and this is data from in young people. And so young people are dying from opioid epidemic um, prescription. And we know that the rise is mainly due to prescribed opioids uh, and mainly um, a shift from weak to strong opioids and a shift from short-acting to long-acting opioids. So we need to stop doing this. This is data from gabapentin from the US. So over 60 million prescriptions for gabapentin uh, in a four-year period and similar increase uh, for Lyrica. And yet what's the evidence for these drugs for, for back pain? 
Well, the evidence in terms of their treatment effect um, with high quality level evidence is that they're not better than placebo. But if you look at the bottom line of this slide, they actually have a uh, increased risk of adverse effects. So this is another um, series of drugs that clearly do more harm than good, just like opioids, and we should stop using them. But in Australia, GPs um, think that, that it treats back pain, it treats any sort of pain because everyone has neuropathic pain. This is what's happened to spinal injections in Australia, uh, a marked increase leading us um, to put this up as one of the choosing wisely um, do not do's from the Australian Rheumatology Association. Um, so high rates of facet joint and epidural injections. This is what happens, what's happening with spinal fusion just in one state in New, in New South Wales. Uh, we have a dual um, health system, about 50% of um, Australians have private health insurance as well and you can see what happens in the private hospitals compared to the public hospitals uh, and you can think about why that might be. Uh, in November the government is stopping uh, subsidy for uncomplicated back pain um, spine fusion. Uh, so this is a start uh, and hopefully it's going to reduce spinal fusion in Australia uh, but if any, if other, uh, but surgeons can use different item numbers. So I remain sceptical that this is going to stop um, imaging, uh, stop um, spine surgery, but it's a start. And finally, research waste. So in 2011, I looked at the WHO Registry of Clinical Trials to see how many had been registered back pain or low back pain in that year. There were 40. I did it last night just for the year to date. There were 313. Not all of them are trials, um, a lot of weird stuff. Um, and have a look at, as I just put a selection. Um, my favourites for um, 2011 uh, were um, things like virtual reality. Uh, and there is one in 2018 where they use gaming to try and reduce chronic back pain. Um, but look at um, therapeutic enemas. So there are at least two trials I found that were comparing different types of enemas for back pain, um, different Indian remedies that, yeah, PRP. Uh, and I really liked um, shockwave therapy, which we've proven doesn't work for other conditions. So I'm sure it's not going to work for back pain, but I'm a skeptic. And I really like backward walking on a treadmill. And I tried that this morning and uh, I'm clumsy at the best of times, but can you imagine the harm that's going to happen from backward walking on a treadmill for elderly people? Importantly, there were, I found no implementation trials, not a single one, 2011 or 2018. So we need a strong and coordinated action to address the global epidemic of poor care. And I think if there's a will, there's a way. Uh, and the Lancet's a good start, but we need to work together um, to make this uh, reality. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge all the um, authors of the working group, particularly uh, the steering group and um, Jan, uh, who uh, was the deputy chair. Uh, and we have a collection of slides uh, and so contributions from slides from all these people as well. And now my last slide again, uh, if you want to contact me, thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, this was a good start of this seminar and webinar. So I expect you have comments or questions to the message that you have sent, Rochelle. Do we have a comment from the audience? Yes, please. Thanks, Rochelle, for a nice uh, presentation. Um, I was just wondering uh, with regards to the developing countries and, and there's a, a trend towards uh, high prevalence, low back pain there. And um, we're looking at research waste and now looking at how we're going to look more at the implementation of high value care. Um, I was just thinking in the, in the development countries, it's a, an issue with uh, contextualization of models of care. And I'm just wondering, 
uh, what your perspective is there, how we go about that. Contextualize. Oh, uh, context is really important. Uh, we looked at guidelines. And so, for example, Brazil um, just adopted the high income country guidelines. And some of those things may not apply or may not be appropriate for those countries. And I think it has to be very um, context specific and it's got to be co produced with people on the ground who know the setting. So I think that's extremely important. Um, one thing that is happening is that, that there are there are lots of bad initiatives that are happening. Uh, so missionary type medical care that are going into those countries um, that I think is really harmful, uh, and they want MRIs and they want more care. But it, I think that's only going to make it worse. But it's got to be very con contextual. Um, there's some data that in some countries traditional healers. Um, could be brought into the traditional fold and educated and um, there could be um, village workers, who health workers. So there are lots of different things, ways of addressing things in, in developing countries that wouldn't work in high-income countries but will work. Thank you very much for a, a very interesting uh, presentation and also the, um, the series in the Lancet has been very helpful. Um, one issue, I think, is patient expectations, um, which we hardly ever discuss. Um, what's your uh, thoughts on that? Uh, well, I, I do discuss it. I didn't talk about it today, but I think that's a huge a uh, huge issue uh, and we've made it worse by feeding those expectations. Uh, there, there have been public health campaigns, as you know, in Australia where Victoria have better beliefs than New South Wales and have lower rates of um, workers' compensation for back pain. We're just about to repeat that survey because I think there's still those differences exist. We need newer ways of educating the public. We need um, social media. Um, so that's why we focused a lot on the Twitter um, campaign for the Lancet series and we reached a lot of um, consumers that way. Uh, but we also need to be giving them the same messages so we can't be giving them the con conflicting advice that people give. Uh, so the clinicians have to band together <coughs> and have to want to, to change as well. <coughs> okay, next question is from the web. Yeah, we have uh, two questions from the web, and we'll start with one that, that I think it's, I, I know you, you have some an answer to, and it's about uh, people saying it would be great to have these talks at the big back pain and rheumatology conferences, and, um, and w why aren't we hearing that at these conferences? Maybe you have a comment on that. Yes, so um, you will be. We're... we're Next week, we've been invited to the North American Spine Society, so we have a workshop there. Um, I don't know how many people will come to our workshop. Uh, and I've been trying really hard to get a session at ULA. So if the person who's asking the question has anything to do with ULA, they should uh, try and influence things. Uh, yesterday, or two days ago, unfortunately, I got the answer back that no, uh, rheumatologists aren't interested in treating back pain. So... Um, that's a problem. I know there's going to be a session, I think, Nadine, at the World Physiotherapy um, Conference, um, and we're really trying hard to try and, and be at major conferences and talk. I'm talking at the Australian Rheumatology Association meeting next year, which is in um, association with APLA, which is the Asian Pacific. Um, so that's another big meeting where we will talk. But I agree. I think our series of slides can be made available to anyone who wants to put in to talk at any of these major meetings. Oh, thank you. We have two questions. Uh, I think I start with the first one from the webinar. And that is, what is, in your opinion, first-line care in acute low back pain in the first two to four weeks? <laughs> Swedish participant who asked. So uh, we know that over 50% of people that have an acute episode of back pain never see a health professional. Uh, and I think that my best advice is uh, don't seek care. Um, 
that's what we wanted to do in our public health campaign, the, the first ad. Um, but obviously that's been a bit uh, too, too swift. Uh, and uh, first-line care really is, um, Nadine is going to cover this, but it's really providing education about um, addressing patients' misconceptions. So I think trying to under, I understand why they've come to seek care and what their conception of back pain is, what, what do they think is the cause, what do they want um, is really important. So communicating is very important. Providing advice about the natural history, which is that it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to be better in a few weeks. Um, you, I, I often to suggest that they buy green uh, um, contact lenses because it doesn't really matter what you do, but um, it, there's a lot of money to be made by getting in early and, and treating people with back pain early. Of course, I'm being cynical uh, and there are people who present who are at high risk of chronicity and so it's really important to identify those early. So identify people that have poor coping, have bad beliefs that you know might have, be at high risk of persistence. Um, so I think that's really important in, in first-line care as well. And don't image unless you're worried about a serious cause but even then for some of those um, you can afford to wait and if the pain doesn't get better think about delayed imaging. You have another one? Yeah we have actually two other ones. Um, I think I think uh, in the row they came in. Uh, in the context of pain being amplified by many triggers such as nocebos, I wonder why is the lower back on the last slide of Professor Bochbinder presentation in red? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's just the Lancet um, Lancet <laughs> logo. I, I, uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll change. I'll try. And, I don't know if I can change the colour, but that's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> And the next um, more serious one, I think. I'm interested in the dil dilemma of the EBHC. I don't know what that stands for. Information dissemination occurring since the 1980s, but implementing, not improving. How do you see Lancet changing this, especially for GPs? Looking forward to welcoming you here at the NAS. Craig Liebenson, please. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, so I think um, my first answer to that is that you have to think big. And in the last paper in the series, we talked about what different groups of people need to do. And we started at the WHO. So we need to um, get it into the heads of the policymakers internationally and then nationally. Um, we know already what good care looks like and we need to make sure our policies and our reimbursement uh, is in line with that. We need to stop rewarding bad care and start rewarding good care. Um, if I could, I'd get rid of fee-for-service altogether and just make us all salaried. I know that's not very popular. Uh, and, then, and then we also need um, uh, public health initiatives. We need work, uh, initiatives um, to address work disability, we need um, clinician um, working together, and we, and so and we need to do things all across those the range. I think you can't just fix one thing. And the reason I think we keep failing is that we try and do one thing at a time. We try and um, do an implementation study to change clinician behaviour, but we forget that clinician behaviour is influenced by lots of things, as I showed you in that complex slide. And we have to make sure they're all working in the same way and they're not conflicting. Otherwise, we're not going to move forward. Um, I, don't, that's, I don't know how to do it, but I think that's the answer. We had the questions from the audience too. Thanks a lot for your very nice and inspiring talk. You had a lot of good points, and one of them is that all of this, or lots of these problems come from our search for a structural diagnosis, and I think that's very central to this problem. Um, and I think that it's not really, 
we can't really blame clinicians that they search a lot for clinical or, or structural diagnosis because that's what they are taught. Um, so I think we, we need a, a change in, in training of clinicians. It's my view or my perception that clinicians feel that a skilled clinician should make a structural diagnosis to work from. Uh, so I think both your points on educating uh, the public so that they may change their expectations to clinicians is very central, but also our uh, clinical training uh, ought to change in order to uh, shift the focus away from structural diagnosis. Well, I mean, I don't know. I I, tr I teach medical students. I tra teach physios. I don't teach them to look for the structural change. I think part of the problem is the feedback they get. So they get imaging reports that outline everything. So they think and, and then advice to, to inject or to have another test. So I think that even if they start out with the right uh, edu education and understanding, they're, they're bombarded with um, bad ideas from other clinicians. Um, so I think that it's fundamental that we teach people correctly and that we follow it up with continued medical education. But I think part of the problem is that they need to understand how to read evidence. They need to understand um, how to critically appraise the evidence for causation, the evidence for treatment, uh, and they need to stop relying on their personal experience. Um, they need to stop the cognitive dissonance um, when it affects their back pocket. I mean, the, those are the issues that I think drive a lot of it as well, and, and they're driven by what their peers are doing. So th I think that's why ch the Choosing Wisely campaign, I don't know if you have it in Nordic countries, I think it's just starting to show that we can make a difference and it's clinician-led. Okay, we have another question from the audience, and maybe some more from the web. Um, I just want to say, if you want to tell us who you are, you're welcome to do that too when you post the questions. Thank you, and I will start with that. My name is Eva rasmussen Bär from Karolinska Institute. And actually, and thank you very much for such an interesting uh, discussion and presentation. Actually, I had the same comment here about the education of physiotherapists and medical doctors and other professions, because if you start with a campaign for changing the behaviors for clinicians. I mean, you, at the same time, you need to change how we are taught at the physiotherapy programs, for example. So, but I know also the problem, you are taught specific things at the physiotherapy programs, and then you go out and work clinically, and then you are really influenced by how every clinician work or believe in. Yes, I agree. Okay, how about web comments? Okay, um, we have an active uh, uh, group out there. They are already posing questions for the next presenter. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, um, I think we can end this very fantastic start of this day. And uh, Rachel, thank you very much for introducing us to the field. And it's always lovely to hear your discussions and comments uh, with the audience. So again, thank you for being Isha. here.